down whenever you're ready. All right, ladies and gentlemen, everyone. Uh, I think these are off. Ready to go. Do what? I think we turned those off. I told him to cut them. Check one, two. That one works. All right, everybody, we're going to uh, start our second talk of the day. Who's got a cup of coffee on him? Is everybody we're getting taken care of? Everyone's awake? Decode's going to hand out Adderall later on. Um, Decode. None of us know what that is. No. So uh, Tyler's going to do his talk on U.S. search and seizure. I'm going to follow him up with the uh, screen printing so uh, uh, he can take his time because we're going to actually kind of push into lunch. Lunch is going to be provided by ShmooCon. We're going to order some pizzas. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right, ShmooCon. Can we get one without cheese? <laughs> That's it. Can we get one without cheese? Can we get one without cheese for the vegan? Is there anybody else here who's a vegan or a weirdo and yeah, you know, lactose intolerant? It's just this pain in the ass up here that wants something different. Just vegetables. Seriously, does anybody want anything other than a standard pizza, vegetable? Speak now or hold your peace. Speak now. Speak. Yeah. yeah. You're screwed now, people. That's it. So um, I'll do the intro here. Tyler Tripp Pitchford is, uh, check, check, one of these is uh, working too well. Um, Tyler is uh, one of the members of the Hacker Consortium in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a uh, little maker, hacker maker space that we put together. And um, uh, as he'll explain uh, into his uh, talk here, uh, we realized he has uh, talents way beyond what he uh, originally pitched when he walked in the door. So uh, this talk originally was done at ShmooCon, and it was just an unbelievable success, so I begged him to do it here. Um, ShmooCon. So, absolutely. So ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the talk, and uh, thank you, sir. Let's go. We'll be uh, picking on Skydog throughout the talk, so anybody uh, clap for him now. So uh, as Skydog introduced me, my name is uh, Tyler or Tripp in the hacker world. Uh, I am an attorney. I'm also the co-founder of the Azure's BitTorrent client, if anyone used it. Um, other than that, I know how to reverse engineer, I know how to hack, and we'll get on with the talk. Decode, there'll be uh, questions and answers during the session, so please feel free to throw them at us here. I know you're not afraid, but just thought I'd throw it out there. I do not mind fielding questions during my talk, so please, if you have something, just you know, raise your hand or shout it out. And, I don't hear you. The meek, the meek. I, I know. <laughs> Decode. When did that happen? No, but um. I wasn't talking about me. Oh, okay, good, good. Yeah, I don't want the earth. Somebody else can have the earth. To hell with that. But um, so this is my uh, presentation. They took my laptop. It's on the Fourth Amendment, obviously. Is anybody at ShmooCon? Anybody see it? Everybody, thank Heidi for being uh, throwing ShmooCon. <laughs> Al's not here, but we'll pick on him too. Um, so we'll continue. He is such an easy target. But a quick disclaimer, um, I will read this to you. It is vitally important for you to understand that while I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. In no way, shape, or form is this presentation intended to provide you with legal advice. Before relying or acting upon any information learned from this presentation, you consult a licensed attorney in your state. I'm not licensed in Georgia. I am licensed just south of here, though. So if anyone wants to go across the border, we can talk. Um, introduction, what are we going to talk about today? Yeah, I am a, si, es muy bueno. No. Um, so what we're going to talk about today, we got the Constitution. Anybody like the Constitution? Yeah. Everyone who didn't raise their hand, get out! Is that in its current form or the original form? Well, you know, either one. I like the amendment. The Bill of Rights was pretty cool. But um, <laughs> we'll talk to the, uh, about the Fourth Amendment, obviously. That's what we're here to talk about. We will cover the Fifth Amendment. It's a big topic right now. Um, I labeled this specifically the fourth because that's what we focus on, but it's funny, most questions come up on the fifth. So if we want to spend some more time here, I'm happy to. At Shmoo, I had some special requirements requested by them, but you know, this is outer zone, we can kind of do what we want here. Um, <laughs> Skydog, I can do anything I want, right? Go for it. Woohoo! Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, I was just going for it, too. <laughs> but um, so, suspicion standards, we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the exceptions. Uh, the Fourth Amendment and most constitutional laws, anybody who studied it, the exceptions usually do eat the rule. But um, we'll go on with that. So we'll get to, uh, they took my laptop. Uh, I've done my best to make the Fourth Amendment entertaining with Skydog's help. 
We do some hypotheticals, we'll ask some questions, we'll see what's going on, get some feedback from you guys. We'll go over the modern cases, uh, recent developments, and some questions and answers. And this stuff shifts constantly, actually, between ShmooCon and now, which has been, what, two, three weeks, Scott? Not even long at all. Uh, one of the big cases that was in my talk got switched. Mud flap. When did you get here? So uh, <laughs> let's go on with the Constitution. All right, we've got a short quiz here. Anybody who was at ShmooCon is not allowed to answer. How many articles does the Constitution contain? More than one. That's correct, actually. <laughs> Anyone else with more specifics? Seven. There's seven articles plus a preamble and signature. So uh, we've all got something to learn here, apparently. <laughs> How many amendments are there? Relearn. Yeah, yeah, relearn. Yeah, everybody forgot it, right? Come on, one of the most important documents. How many? 27. 27. Who said that? You rock. There are 27 amendments. The first 10 amendments are called. Everyone better get this one. <laughs> it's close. It's close. We are the South, yeah. We, do we have a plaque in here somewhere? No, the, uh, the Bill of Rights, obviously. Anyone who didn't get that series, you should get out or decode and remove you. Um, which article applied most of the Bill of Rights to the states? You're in the South. You should know this, decode. Ah, who's from the South? Come on. If the South is going to rise again. Uh, no, the 14th, actually. The 14th Amendment. After uh, it was brought in, does anybody know why? I gave you hints with the South. It was Reconstruction era. Uh, it was Reconstruction, yeah. They wanted to apply. The Bill of Rights originally, due to federalism, only applied to the federal government. The 14th Amendment applied the Bill of Rights selectively. It's not fully incorporated yet, but we won't go into that um, through the 14th Amendment. So uh, a, very, a very important one. Everybody, uh, now we have the Commerce Clause. Anybody know what the Commerce Clause is? Anyone? Well, the Commerce Clause pretty much regulates everything you do due to interstate commerce, drug laws, gun laws, everything now because of the states are regulated through the 14th Amendment incorporating the Bill of Rights. So, uh, so, if you, so if you bake a cake and you, you buy the product from a different state, does it therefore the cake is now? It's a federal, it's a federal commerce, yeah. Actually, you don't even have to. Uh, it's a lot of specifics. I should give a talk on that. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, the 14th Amendment is a very powerful one. Most of, you hear any griping on TV? Anybody watch Fox News or MSNBC? Any of the griping? It's usually about uh, something that involves the 14th. But no one ever brings that up. But that's all right. Which articles or amendments contain a section on privacy? None. You're right. It's not. It was a, uh, it's a judicial fiction. It was made up by the Supreme Court. So everybody who complains about you know, all the Supreme Court decisions, it did give you a right to privacy. Because the Constitution is obviously what's written, plus in the US we go off stare decisis or prior decisions. So when was the last amendment to the Constitution ratified? This is a good one. You guys were all alive, even the young ones. No, close. It was 92. 1992 was the last amendment, not too long ago. May 7th. Now here's the, here, here's the bonus. Oh, we got a young one? Well, you just learned something. Good. <laughs> when was it proposed? Fail. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> when, when was it proposed? 1962? Nope. 1974? Nope. 1870. Ah, uh, you're a cheater. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. 1883? 1789, wow. actually, by James Madison. Um, it actually has to do with congressional pay changes. So uh, obviously the congressman didn't want to have to wait until their pay raises went into effect, but this got ratified finally in uh, 1992. Government moves quick. Um, <laughs> uh, it's the 27th. Uh, the constitutional pay raises, so uh, congressional pay raises, I should say. So when Congress enacts, uh, they get more money. It doesn't enact until the next Congress moves in. So uh, President Barack Obama was a professor of what? Constitutional law. One of our presidents has actually read the Constitution. I just want to point that out. I'm just saying, if he can teach it, I bet he's read it. He's probably read it more than me, which is scary. But um, good, good. So let's, let's actually get back to the point. Um, the Fourth Amendment. Does anybody know what it deals with? Anybody read the synopsis? Search and seizures. So I'll put it up here. I'll read it to you because I think it's important. The right of the people to be secured in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures 
shall not be violated. That's, that's a suggestion. Uh, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Uh, yes, Geeko. Um, yeah, pretty much D, all of the above. No, it's, 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 you know, it's the law. Everything's a rough definition. Uh, it's, it's up to debate on what it means, which I'm okay with. Uh, you know, if you make a straight law, nobody really knows what it means. So you have to, it kinda, there's an ebb and flow throughout time on what happens. Exactly. It's, it's, it's how it works. Well, we'll get to that, and, and actually the, uh, the border definition is kind of rough um, on where the border is. Some people have said it goes into 100 miles inland. Some people say it's 25. Um, some people have suggested since our international border now extends 250 miles out to the, to the ocean that maybe we can reverse that in ways too. But uh, I think there was a study that said something like uh, if you just did it, it was either 25 or 100 miles in that 95% of the populated U.S had no Fourth Amendment rights then. It's kind of interesting. But um, so important understanding these, if anybody ever reads a Fourth Amendment case, which I hope some of you will, this is your country, you should try to figure out what's going on. There are two parts to the Fourth Amendment uh, if you're reading the decision. There'll be the reasonableness clause and the warrant clause, and they'll refer to it as such. The reasonableness clause is obviously the search has to be reasonable. Um, that definition obviously is fuzzy. And the warrant clause is dealing with when, or when warrants should issue. So just keep that in mind, and you know, I'll probably refer to those at certain points. So an important part, um, and a lot of people don't understand this. It's something to get into your head here. Searches and seizures are separate. They are separate pieces. A person can be seized and searched, for example, a car being pulled over and the car being searched. A person could be seized but not searched. You're pulled over for a traffic citation. Anybody ever been pulled over? Anybody ever been pulled over and searched? Decode. Good. This will be fun. No, um, persons searched but not seized. So thermal scans, x-rays, et cetera, you've all you know, been through the airport. You're searched when you go through. And that's, that's not actually a Fourth Amendment application. We'll talk about that. But you've been searched, but you haven't really been seized. You were allowed to walk freely. You could kind of do what you wanted. But uh, an interesting topic here, and I didn't bring it up with Shmoo because I didn't really have enough time, but um, the way x-rays are scanned, or uh, thermal scans, there was a recent case, the, uh, the Kylo decision, it was a couple years ago by the Supreme Court, but it dealt with thermal scans, and there was some interesting wording by Scalia that basically said it wasn't a valid search. They, they needed a warrant to do a thermal scan on, an ex, uh, on a house. One, because it was a house, it was a property, and, and they have a big, um, yeah, it was, it was a marijuana case, but he, uh, because it was a house, there's usually a higher level, it's just implied, but he said basically there's, there's a debate if it's dicta or not, if it's, it's actually opinion, but that because it wasn't a common technology, it wasn't in common use, like a cell phone, everybody has cell phones now, so if kids had thermal scanners, would it be okay to do that? And what happens with brain scanning eventually became commonplace. So if everybody could just like go over and get your brain scan and you know, replicate your brain, can the government search your brain? And then you get into some interesting topics on what's a thought product at that point. Just something to mull around. But uh, it's an interesting case. The whole thermal scanning thing just came up in Texas because that group, I can't remember the name, uh, took, a, took a residential house and put uh, oh, I, yeah, the, the, around the windows. I did see that. Yeah, the FLIR, the, yeah, which is illegal. Didn't they say they got an anonymous tip, they, too? Yeah, an anonymous tip from a pastor. Yeah, something that made no sense, yeah. Gave an anonymous tip that led to a warrant that busted into this house that didn't have any marijuana in it. Didn't have to have grow lamps at every window. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because it's an illegal search, but it, yeah, it did raise a lot of questions. Yeah, that was a... Uh, there's a, they actually have a video of it when they bust in. It's pretty entertaining. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, the breathalyzers? Uh, well, a breathalyzer is. Well, wait, which falls under what, though? Under search. 
Well, yes, a breathalyzer is a search, but we'll, we'll actually cover that um, when we get to bodily intrusions, which is entertaining. But um, <laughs> that was a special request by an HC member, so I threw it in a couple uh, for Shmoo. They said I get bonus points for throwing in uh, strip searches. But um, search, um, for a search to be valid, or for to have something that's searchable, there has to be an expectation of privacy. And that's, that's actually a pretty loose definition. You can get an expectation of privacy pretty easily. Me standing up here speaking, I have none. This is a public place. I'm going out. But there are cases that say talking in a phone booth that was microphoned, he had an expectation of privacy. Even though it was a public space, it wasn't his house or anything, but because it was closed in and he expected that call to be his, um, that's like the seminal case on this. But um, seizure, so there's two separate standards. There's an individual and then there's property. So an individual, when a person believes he is not free to ignore the government's presence, if you're stopped on the street and you're just asked randomly, you know, hey, what are you doing? You could still walk away. You're allowed to. There's cases on that. Now, there are states with identification laws. Excuse me, can I get your ID? And th that's kind of an interesting area of law right now. Um, there's debates whether you have to comply or not. But if you're just asked by an officer, hey, what are you doing? You could just keep walking. You don't have to say anything, usually. Um, property. A meaningful interference with an interesting professor, <laughs> an individual's possessory interest. And what that means is, you guys have all been to the airport, everyone? You know when they take your laptop, can I see your laptop for a second? That's, that's a seizure. It is. They've taken your laptop. And you guys, does anyone remember when you used to go to the airport and they made you turn it on? Yeah, well that was, it's not a search. They weren't looking for anything. They were just making sure it was turned on. <laughs> I couldn't hear you decode. Does, does anybody remember before that when you could just get on the plane? Yeah, that was awesome. Uh, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't too long ago. Just after that amendment, actually. This would get me thrown in jail. No, no, yeah, you could have taken that on. I, I don't remember what I used to take on. As a kid, I probably had the craziest stuff. But, um, so when they take your laptop, it's not, that's not a search, but it is a seizure. Um, now, if they took it on and started going through all your files, that's a search. But they do that, and that's what's known as administrative search, and we'll cover that just in a minute. So suspicion standards, and we'll talk about this. Mere suspicion, that's just a hunch or a feeling. So if an officer just like, oh, I think that guy looks shady, that's, mere suspicion usually doesn't get you much in the law. Reasonable suspicion is, the general rule is articulable facts. There has to be something tangible the officer can say. So and so was shaking, so and so looked with red eyes, so and so had this. That's, you have to have some tangible reason uh, for suspicion. And then probable cause obviously is a much higher standard. A search and an arrest are different, and that's an important definition here too. So a search, it's reasonable to believe that evidence contraband will be found. Um, that's the requirement that they have to be. The, they have to meet that standard to be uh, able to search you with a probable cause standard. And an arrest is different. There has to be facts and circumstances that indicate that a person had committed or was committing a crime. So they need to actually see this, or they need to believe that something has happened. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? So these, these are the three levels of, uh, of standards we're going to cover. And what, it'll mix, actually. The, you'll see like certain cases and borders have different um, requirements than inside the US for arrest. So one will have reasonable suspicion. One will have probable cause. Schools have a different standard. Schools require reasonable suspicion, not probable cause. So there's, it's differences on that. So keep those in mind. And then exceptions to the rule. Now this is what you were talking about. And there's a lot of them. This is not all of them. These are the bigger ones. Um, border, the biggest of all. That, that one covers almost everything. Plain view, um, which is actually where the Kylo case comes in, that, that the, uh, the heat lamp stuff, that was basically on plain view. Open fields is a really interesting one, but we don't talk about it at all because it's, it's just kind of crazy and it doesn't fit in well with the, the hypotheticals. Um, exigent circumstances, there's some really, really funny cases with this one. There's police officers chasing burglars that bust into houses where people are separating marijuana on a table. And it's perfectly fine because they were in hot pursuit. It's kind of funny. So guys were in their house just doing their thing. Somebody busts in, the cop busts in to chase this robber who's just run through the house and they get arrested for drugs. And, and the robber gets away because the cops are just like, whoa. <laughs> but it's, it's pretty good. Um, search incident to arrest. Yeah, Al could have totally been busted. <laughs> but um, search incident to arrest, this is, a, this is a big one. A lot of cases you'll see someone's pulled over, arrested, and we'll actually talk about it at the end. They're allowed to do certain limited searches during an arrest, and then there's inventory searches, which is actually a civil search. It's known as administrative or civil search. 
That's like an inventory, or when you go to the airport, that's not a criminal, that's an administrative. So a motor vehicle has a reduced standard. So if you're pulled over in a car, they can pretty much just do whatever they want. So the, the golden rule on that. Oh, the, the sodomy statute? No, the, uh, <laughs> they, well, they just changed the sodomy Decode, statute. Decode, you would know that, wouldn't you? <laughs> but um, the motor vehicle statute has been changed. Oh, wait, I, I think I did see something on that, actually. Specifically with, uh, with, with regard to uh, personal firearms. Oh, really? You can now put your firearm in plain view, between your feet, under your seat, not in your center console, not just previously in your glove box. And, that's and, that and if you put it in plain view, you're an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, what's interesting there is you actually bring up some of the interesting states. So uh, it's not in the talk and it's a little off point. But uh, so the Constitution provides this base level. So you're guaranteed those Bill of Rights, right? And, and whatever that loose sense is. But a state can't provide less, but they can provide more. So some states, now I, I usually call it the federal, the federal law because it's more applicable to everybody. But the the state, if the state says, you know, well, our search and seizure, you know, you can't search a car, boom. You're, you're, you're guaranteed that right by the state at that point. But the federal law is just the baseline, so keep that in mind. Um, public schools, I mentioned, have a reduced standard and consent. If you say, yes, search my house, that's, you're done, part of the rule. But, um, so let's get to it. Let's do some hypotheticals. Let's have some fun. I expect other people besides Decode to talk. So this, this was actually thrown in for ShmooCon, but I kept it because there's a really good quote I like. So resident aliens, uh, anyone not a citizen or a naturalized citizen? All right, so this will cover for you. Um, generally aliens, uh, illegal or not, are treated uh, roughly the same under the Constitution. And the rules, uh, I won't go through the cases here, we'll try to get through this quickly. The rules are roughly, once they've established or attempted to establish a life here, you get constitutional rights. Um, Basically, and if it's a criminal trial, if you're arrested for murder or whatever, you're guaranteed the same constitutional rights no matter if you're a citizen or not. The, the, the rules on that are the same, which is a, it's good, I like that. But um, my favorite quote is right here. This is great. So the, this is a Wong Wing U.S., it's 1896, but they said, the contention that the persons within the territorial jurisdictions of the Republic might be beyond the protection of the law was heard with pain on the argument at bar in face of the great constitutional amendment which declares that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. I think that's pretty awesome. The Supreme Court basically said, I can't believe the government came in here and said we shouldn't give these rights to, to aliens. And I mean, this was 1896. And with uh, the modern administration, you'd think it was slightly different, but you've got this, the Hamdi v. Rumsfeld case, which was actually a sister case to one of the cases on a, the just a couple slides back that we didn't go over. But a state of war is not a blank check for the president when it comes to the rights of the nation's citizens. Awesome. Does anyone else like that, or is it just me? Yeah, thank you, thank you. This, is, this was good, and I think we'll see some more of this probably in the future, which is good. I mean, we should be protecting our rights. We were given them, we fought for them. They're ours. Um, but it's, it's exactly, that's why we shoot people. <laughs> um, so let's try to make this fun. Uh, which, with the Fourth Amendment, it's a, it's a task, but we'll, we'll get there. So here's the rules. All scenarios are warrantless unless stated otherwise. I don't believe any of them actually mention a warrant. Uh, I think at the end, maybe. But it is the current date. It's the current present time. So the current case law is in effect. So this will be our, uh, our guinea pig. You guys know and love him. Yeah. Sky dog. Um, age, I actually don't know, but it's really old. And he's a, obviously the hacker consortium godfather, the outer zone and freaknik mastermind. And he's prisoner number 42. Anyone get the reference? Somebody's got yeah, to in here. Uh, <laughs> was a prisoner, but uh, 42? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, thank you. But um, note, uh, just to avoid defamation, Skydog did give me permission to do this, one. But two, these are not real Skydog actions, I hope. And uh, we're just using his name, and obviously his awesome, cute little face. Look at him. He's so, he's so. Oh, he's like a big puppy. <laughs> But um, so, let's go on. Communications, this is a big one. Everybody loves this, everybody uses communications, right? So, Skydog has just attended Outer Zone 09 and decides to tell his friends, all two of them, how amazing it was. He calls, writes a letter to, and emails his friend Wrench, which I wish was here, but he's not, and Bush. Anybody know Wrench and Bush? Yeah. yeah. 
So we've got, uh, we've got some photos here. Rinch doesn't like his photo taken, so we use Seabine. He's our lovely stand-in. And Bush, this was at ShmooCon. Anybody who knows Bush probably knows what was going on. But, um, yeah, I'm Bush, yeah. But, um, so let's go back to this. He writes a letter to, he calls and he emails. What do you think happens? And does anybody notice one's in the US and one's outside the territory, right? Very important distinction here. So let's figure out. The mail, uh, US v. Selgin. Uh, this was a 2008 case, pretty recent, and it changed the rules. This was the big case for a long time, US v. Ramsey. And they got changed in 2008 slightly. So reasonable suspicion, slightly. <laughs> slightly, a little tweak. Reasonable suspicion used to be required in the big case, one second decode. But the main case basically said they had to have some, remember that reasonable suspicion, they had to have some reason to search that box. So if it was, you know, white powder was flowing out, or it was ticking or buzzing, you know, everybody's seen Fight Club. Yeah, you know, if there was a lot of blood flowing out of it, there was a reason to look at it. But otherwise, it just went out of the country, no problem. You, you didn't have a right to search it. Um, but the uh, new case, Selgin, basically said that since paper documents, you can commit fraud with, you know, a fraudulent, a fraudulent deed, or you could be sending money to a terrorist organization, there could be some crime committed with just paper, as long as they want, the, the customs agents at the border can open it and search it. Kind of interesting, they, they changed the law basically. They can look at anything they want now um, if it's going outside the border. If it's in the border, you're gonna need some, some reason for it. Is that going both ways? Yeah, that's uh, going out or coming in. Uh, the border stuff, when I mentioned the border, that is either way, ingress or um, egress. Do you have a question? How much suspicion is reasonable? Uh, well, reasonable suspicion just means articulable facts, so you have to have something, some reason that you, that you can articulate, like there was blood on the box, so I opened it. So, uh, Bush is in Iraq. He is. Um, any more detail, or is Bush in Iraq? Uh, yeah, he's in Iraq. Is Bush Either way, it doesn't really matter, actually. Well, yes, if he's in a U.S. territory there, but if it's going across the border, as long as it's transferring outside U.S. jurisdiction, it shouldn't really be an argument. Yeah, well, however, he's at an ATO or an ATO. Yeah. Well, yeah, if, if he's at a satellite and it's traveling, he should get military jurisdiction. No, yeah, it becomes the, it becomes the military jurisdiction. And there, there are a different set of rules. The military can change what they do. Much stricter. Yeah, you, uh, well, that's, it's somewhat of a waiver. If you sign up for the military, you go for a different set of rights. Yeah, yeah. Fun, isn't it? But um, so when he makes the phone call, you guys have all heard this. You guys know the FISA cases. Everybody's heard the FISA warrantless wiretap. Everyone here should know this stuff. Um, but this is the fun part. The rules, the way they're defined, and they were approved by the court, and we'll, we'll talk about that. It only proved that they, they did not sanction the previous wiretapping. They only said, everybody heard about the, the case where the, uh, the FISA court came out and said it was OK. It only applies post pre uh, to the Protect America Act. So post Protect America Act, the PAA, um, they said that's okay because the law gives them permission to do it now. But before that, there's been no decision on it still. But the interesting part about the FISA and the warrantless wiretapping laws are, it says that one party has to be believed to be outside the US to not have to require a warrant to be searched. Just believed. So interesting there, kind of fun. And if anybody saw the uh, keynote at uh, ShmooCon, he actually discussed this a little, which was fun. But I don't know, I, I'm kind of worried when there's rough definitions such as believed to be outside the US. No, it has to be a reasonable belief. You can't be like, oh, I think the guy's in Canada. But I don't know, it just bothers me some. But it is an interesting thing. And it only has to be one party. So if I'm making a call from here outside the US, they don't need a warrant to wiretap that. And, and there is another clause that says it has to be related to some kind of the belief that there's a terrorist thing going on. But all of those fuzzy definitions so are interesting. Goes, outside, goes the outside the U.S. Qualifies half of the sweep. Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, most data is going to be heading outside the U.S. and routed out. So if they wanted to, they could probably set up, you know, a great wall of the U.S. similar to China and monitor about anything that they could turn on and off switches, which is basically what they were doing. Um, yeah, of course they're not doing it anymore. No, of course not. So that's 
those are communications outside the U.S. Obviously, in the U.S., this stuff changes. Um, they need to get a warrant if they're going to wiretap these. They, they have wiretap warrants, and it's actually a pretty, pretty high standard for those. Um, the government, uh, you know, the courts are pretty suspicious of wiretapping people. Um, but email. So there's a couple of different areas in email, and these are really important for computer professionals. One, if it's on your personal machine at your house, they're going to usually need a warrant or an exception, some, some reason that they're going to be searching your machine. They either need to get a warrant or they have to have some exception, plain view, whatever. On a remote server, anybody use Gmail, anything like that? You don't really have, you have an expectation of privacy, but Gmail is probably going through your email to look up those keywords and whatnot. So one, has that been opened already? Has it been accepted? And it's on a remote server. They can just subpoena the records. They don't need a warrant. They can just ask for your email from a court. What was it that uh, pen registers? The pen registers, that's the wiretapping, um, the laws of the US. The wiretap and the pen registers, they kind of merge into one. No, I, I do believe pen registers still require it. Um, I'm by no means a wiretap expert, but I, I, the law may have changed the last time I checked, but I'm pretty sure, well, pen registers are private, but I, mean, I, I can check for you. I really am not positive, but I'm pretty sure in all my research, I remember pen registers requiring that. Not the content. Well, they may be able to, well, that, that probably, the account information they can get with a court order, they may be able to just ask for who they were talking to, but not actually, yeah, tap the, law, tap the, the line on the register. Uh, you're probably correct in that sense. Uh, I was wondering, I remember something about being a flash email. Yeah, oh, where they were talking about. Well, yeah, the, uh, it's, it's similar, it's, it's analogous to um, a requesting account information. If they just were like, hey, who, was using, who sent this email? They can ask and just get a court order for the, to be disclosed. And the, you know, the ISP will just say, yeah, it was this person, um, which everybody knows the RIA likes to do those. But that's private, so. Public libraries? Well, well it does depend, but roughly, um, I would probably say that you've got an expectation of privacy using that computer, unless it's declared you have no expectation of privacy using this computer. So they'd probably have to get some kind of permission to wiretap it. But there's no reason that the, if it was a private library, they could just filter all your traffic if they wanted to. Now, if it's a public institution and you get into these weird mixes. See, that's government. It says you waive your rights. So you're waiving yeah. your rights. Well, that's, that's consent. And, and, and it's, yeah, it's consent. Yeah. Or are you consenting? Just and that's, I, I think you'll start seeing more of that, actually, because the libraries want to protect themselves. Um, it's expensive for the government to come in and start tapping all your machines and using all your resources. So if they just waive it and the government wants to come in, they don't have to fuss with it anymore. So it's, it's a business decision. But um, so let's move on to see what Skydog is next. So after Outer Zone 0950 has been evicted and his laptop was stolen by some asshats, one of the asshats turned on the laptop, found all of Skydog's hacker consortium files, freaked out, like people always do when they say that there's a hacker, and called the police. The police have Skult Malton, oh, did he leave? That punk. And uh, run in case on Sky's machine. I don't know. Scott probably did that. Yeah, yeah, Scott probably clicked the button. That's so above Scott now. So what do you, what do you think? Anybody? What do you think happens here? Well, of course, that's what always happens in these cases. Yeah, I, I should note most Fourth Amendment cases deal with uh, either terrorism or kiddie porn. But we. <laughs> yeah. And that's why we have all these laws to stop child pornography. Well, well that's, that we got to think of the kids. But, um, so, this, this, this area covers what's known as private search. So if somebody goes through your stuff before the government, what happens? And there's, there's two big cases, and one of them's recent. So USB Runyon, um, and this, this is, all these cases have ridiculous backstories. They're all really funny. But this one, a, a wife and the husband were getting divorced, so the wife decided to go through all his zip disks and started plugging them in. And of course, she finds kitty porn in the middle of one of them. Calls the police. You know, they come and they investigate. And the case went up to the uh, uh, to the Fifth Circuit, I should say. And they basically the, the law that was set down, the precedent was that since the government didn't need a warrant to search the ones that she'd already viewed. 
but the ones that she hadn't opened, they needed a warrant to get it. So it was a, an interesting line draw there. It was the open container. So what defined a container? And this new case, you guys have probably, probably seen it if you read any of the news sites, USB Christ. It was a Middle District, Pennsylvania. We didn't talk about jurisdiction. Um, there just isn't time. But cert, you know, jurisdictions are separate in the US. So if these cases aren't US Supreme Court, it applies to that jurisdiction. I'll just throw that the quick, the quick rundown on jurisdiction. But um, the court said that using in case to hash files on a drive is a search. So what happened in this case is they took the hard drive, they scanned it, they ran in case, and they ran hash files across it, but they didn't get a warrant. So they had the hard drive, they confiscated the machine, but they didn't get a warrant to search the drive for any further information. Now, it had been taken by, you know, in this case, it would have been taken by and looked through by these other people, but whatever was viewed, they still should have got a warrant, is what the court said. And what's interesting about that is that they didn't search the drive they, they used an automated tool to do it, and it was only generating hash files, and the government argued basically that we weren't searching the drive, we were only looking for hash files. But the court, and I think correctly, stated no, that hash files receiving is returning information. It's telling you something about the contents of that file. Because the way InCase works, and I wish Scott was here because he can explain it better, but InCase runs through, it hashes the files, and it compares it with a database that, of, of known hashes. So you can, with a really strong probability, I mean, there's no statistics of it, say that, yes, this file is the same as that hash, even though you've never opened it. So I think the government was correct, and I think the courts were correct in saying that you are doing a search when you're using in case, and that's, that's the interesting thing here. Sure. What, what type of hash is on the database? Um, I'm not sure if it's MD5 or SHA1s. I'm sure it's one of the two. It's hashes of what? Oh, oh, it's always kitty porn. Um, almost always, but you could do this, in case can use any database provided to it, but it, in this case, in the Chris case, it was, it was kiddie porn, same as usual. But, um, so it was, it was an interesting decision, and I'm sure this will get appealed, and we'll see what comes up next, but. Uh, um, in, in agreeing with the court there, there's actually some companies actually provide uh, lists of hashes to their um, clients, and they don't also, really, in the cases that they quoted, use those to describe the to scan through, yeah, it's, it's a similar thing. Um, yeah, it's, it's the same type of systems. The funny part about that, the, the funny part about hashing all of that is, I thought you were saying the funny part about kitty porn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Eric, I, I, as much as Joe said, I think uh, I'm, I'm very much uh, against uh, child pornography. I'm okay with that. Uh, but over, uh, Joe, okay, let me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, oh, wait, we, we'll get to that, actually. Maybe. We're running slow. The thing about hash files, using hash files to search for pornography is is very short sighted because one pixel changes the hash. Changes the hash. Well there there's been some interesting talks about that actually on you know how, how accurate it becomes and why don't people just slightly corrupt the headers and whatnot. Yeah, you change the resolution of the image. And it's different. It's just it's different. Yeah, it's it's not the best way to search for things. Oh, I'm, yeah. Going back to the original search, which is what the result of the Russian case, wouldn't the government just have been smart ballers when they were given warrants for that by the search and used that to apply for the warrant and bring it up? Well, that's, that's usually what happens, and that's fine. I, I mean, they warrants. Didn't they didn't do that here. They got exactly, and that's, that's what the interesting part is. Most of these cases, they could have got a warrant, no problem. Most of these, they've got reasonable suspicion, yeah. They've got, they've got probable cause in almost every one of these cases, and they've got reasonable suspicion. I mean, if someone's found kiddie porn, it's a reliable source, and they're like, I found kiddie porn on my husband's you know, zip drive. Boom, they could have got a warrant, done. No problem, no judge isn't gonna grant that. that that's probable cause. Like, there's good faith that a crime has been committed or is being committed. Not a problem, but in these cases, they don't do it. They're just, they forget to, or they're too lazy, or you know, the computer tech gets a little ambunctious, rambunctious and just starts plugging in hard drive search and stuff. And that's what all these cases go up on. Um, but uh, so Skydog back again. Skydog gets back his laptop from the police and boots up Windows Millennium. That's cool. The machine is hacked into it by a Turkish citizen on the hunt for terrorist hackers. After finding Skydog's hacker consortium documents, the man quickly reports Skydog to the FBI. And uh, obviously, most of these are based on real cases. But um, these are these are kind of interesting. I'll just try to get through these quick because we're running out of time. But the okay, the unknown user cases. Uh, U.S. v. Stiegler, it was an 11th case, but the, uh, the background is basically this. The guy hacks into machines looking for kiddie porn. Um, he, you know, he sets out Trojans on these kiddie porn mailing lists. 
hacks into the machines, goes through, finds it, and then he calls the cops when he finds it. He's a Turkish citizen on, on the hunt. But what was interesting is, in the two cases, and this is where the private search factors come into play, and this is where it gets interesting, and to understand these, the government encouraged uh, the two things that d define the factors of whether the government involvement. So if the government's not involved, you know, if it's a private search, that's fine. If somebody goes through your machine, if you come in and you go through my laptop and you find something illegal, it's not a search because the Constitution doesn't restrict private citizens. It restricts the government, okay? But th there's that gray line on... But has that individual broken the law? Well, yes, uh, most likely. Um, but that's... Is the law in Turkey to hack into the United States by flight from Turkey? Uh, I couldn't... I don't know Turkish law. I'm, well, I was a former expert. I've since forgotten said knowledge. No, um, but it's funny. You've got to remember prosecution can selectively choose what they prosecute. So sometimes vigilante acts just aren't taken care of. But they're um, giving you a pass. Yeah, thank you for helping. You know, we'll forget your transgressions because you helped us. But the, um, the two factors here, which kind of define where that gray line between when a private citizen becomes a government actor, and that's what these cover here, did the government encourage or initiate the search, or were they aware or accurate, eh, acquiesced to the search? So were they like, yeah, go ahead and search that laptop for us, or excuse me, would you mind clicking on this file for me? That's probably going to be government action. And, and this and is very important here, and did the private actor intend to help law enforcement? So if the first part is met, but the and part isn't, then it's, it's not. It's not government action, or reversed. So in this case, the guy, completely intended to involve himself in, uh, to help law enforcement. I mean, that was the entire point was he was going in and looking at this. And, but the first part is the government didn't know about it, so it was okay. It wasn't government action. It was a private citizen or a private action in this case. Now, what's interesting is in these two cases, so he did it twice. There's two cases on the same guy, same scenario. The first one was perfectly fine. It was okay. No problem. The USB Jarrett, or no, I should say the uh, USB Stegler was the first case in this one. It came out later because that's an appellate court. But um, the Stiegler case, they said, yeah, that's cool, no problem. He was a private citizen, or he was on his citizen. He was a private actor, no government involvement, search was valid, boom. The second one, they said, no, they know this guy had done this before, and they'd sent out some more information. The, the government had said, yeah, could you get us his IP address? Could you get us this? They started asking for information without a warrant. And at that point, there was government involvement. They were using him as an agent of the government. So it's, kinda, it's a really interesting set of cases to illustrate the point. One case, perfectly fine. In another case, same guy, same facts, not okay. So if the U.S. government accidentally arrested a Turkish citizen for another crime and found the IP addresses in his laptop at that point, pointing to the other people... Well, yeah, if it, if it was actually an accident and they found other information pertaining to the case, that's, that's most likely going to be fine. Well, um, he was brought into the United States with his laptop. The laptop and he happened to search it? Yeah, not a problem. Um, no issue, as long as they didn't set it up, you know. If, you, if they actually just found, like, oh, look, there's a listing of all of Skydog's so kitty he porn. Just, he just magically got them in the space to Disney World? Yeah, you, you know, well, Turkey, well, yeah, if somebody... That's what you're asking. Yeah, yeah, I mean, <laughs> if they're inviting them to Disney World, they, we got some good arguments there. But, um, so this, let's get to the meat of it. And Skydog, I'm really going to run into your time. But, uh, that's okay, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. Border crossings. So, Skydog is stressed out and takes a vacation to Mexico and engages in some serious <laughs> drinking. Um, while returning, he has a feeling he's going to be searched and not being quite in his right mind. Skydog swallows his cell phone. He also attempts to hide his laptop, but is unable to fit it. Hey, Skydog, what were you carrying? A compact luggable? But uh, we all know Skydog uses a Mini 9, so uh, you think he could have tried harder, right? But um, obviously, Skydog gets selected for a search. And this is, this is, uh, this is good, because this is, might be what it looks like. Um, there's the action shot. This was, a, this was actually shot in the uh, lobby of ShmooCon right before my talk, which is pretty funny. But um, I couldn't show the one where he actually swallows it. He told me he'd choke me. But um, no. Um, so border crossings, this is what everybody's been talking about lately. Like, you brought it up. It's, it's the hot topic here. Um, so the big case, USB Arnold, this kind of set the pace. Laptops are no different from closed containers, which are subject to suspicionless search. Now, when we talked about that Runyon case where they talked about the containers, like what's the space once it's been opened, and on the border, they, it used to be you could search whatever, you know, they could pull out your gas tank and whatnot, but we'll talk about that in one second. In this case, uh, a laptop is just like a parcel. You know, you guys have been through customs, anyone been on a cruise or coming back in the U.S., you know, and they go through your suitcase. 
Well, a laptop is just like a suitcase. That's what this case says. We, hold on, we want to look through here. They can just go rummaging through it, no problem. Um, kind of crazy. What if the uh, piece of electronics was different? I'm not going to specify a computer. Was yeah, it's not specifically a computer. Necessary, necessary does the same. Oh. It's not his issue. No. Um, it, yeah, the, they can search it if it's coming through the border. Uh, obviously, they can't kill you. Um, but <laughs> if, if it's still going to function and they pull it off, everybody's seen a wheelchair search before? I've, I've seen it at the airports. They'll, they'll search a wheelchair, no problem. It's the same thing. Um, Gas tank? Yeah. Oh, definitely. They'll move the kid out and then take it apart. Putting all the baby bottles out. Yeah. No, the best thing that you can do to keep a, an asshole TSA agent out of, out of your bag. They're government agents. Come on. Leave a, leave a dirty diaper in there. <laughs> what about, what, what if you're like on your bag? Uh, well, yeah. well, we're going to get to that. And that's, that's actually in a couple of slides. I'm going to hold off on that. And that's, that's the real hot topic here. Um, but what's, what's important about border crossings, and there, there are different levels of border crossings. There's routine and non-routine. A routine search is, it's, it's reasonable since the fact that you're coming across the border. That's the exception. Um, you're coming into this country, it is reasonable for them to search you. They have reasonable cause at that point, no problem. You're coming across the border, it's a lowered standard. Non-routine searches, they require reasonable suspicion. They require something articulable. And non-routine is like taking your gas tank out, strip searches, that kind of stuff. That is a non-routine search. It's not, everybody doesn't get this, you're special. Anybody in the strip search at the border? All right, sweet. No, but um, was it voluntary or not? That's the question. No, um, but uh, excuse me, could I be selected for a random strip search? So, that's, yeah, exactly. While searching his laptop, the officers find a drive named My Illegal Files. Good name, Sky. And proceed to uh, open a document containing what appears to be a listing of credit card numbers. They confiscate the laptop, but upon turning it back on, they find the drive has been encrypted. And that's exactly what you're acting about. Now, this, this happens. Uh, everybody's heard, read this case. Anybody heard about it? The Boucher case. At Shmoocon, I got to call it the Boucher case because I want to be a southerner. But since we're in the south, I'll correct it. It's the Boucher. Henry Boucher. Um, this case was just updated. Uh, anybody see the update? I mean, it literally came out, I think it was a couple days ago, uh, not even February 19th, something along those lines. Not long at all. But um, the original case, the encryption keys are products of the mine and not subject to disclosure under the Fifth Amendment. Not correct anymore. It's been overruled. Um, this was a magistrate decision. And the way it works in a federal court, you have a magistrate makes a base ev uh, evidentiary decision sometimes, depending on how, what uh, levels you select. And they appealed it to the, to the, um, the, the district, uh, the one level up. Not the, uh, not the actual circuit, but just the, the judge over top of the magistrate there. And the, uh, the judge said, no, no, never mind, it's not. So everybody was all like, yay, not anymore. Uh, this case has been overruled, essentially, but the reason is interesting. Um, the Boucher case, the guy was coming across the border and he was stopped for a search. And the officer said, can I search your hard drive? Or, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna search your laptop. So the guy hands his laptop over and there was an encrypted Z drive. It was using PGP encryption. He unencrypted it. He said, it was, it was oh, he already had it mounted, you are correct. It was already mounted, he already had it. He didn't, you know, and the laptop, the guy's like looking through, he sees the Z drive, opens it up, finds kitty porn. Uh, they shut, the, he's like, okay, I'm taking your laptop, you know, this is suspicious, close it, take it, you can complicate it, not a problem there. He takes the laptop, they go to boot it back up, boom, encrypted. So they said, hey, give us your password, we want to encrypt it. No, I'm not going to give it to you. So he brings up the Fifth Amendment, and this is the Fifth Amendment, so we'll, we'll talk about it because everybody loved it. But um, he boots it back up and they're like, we want your password. And he said, no. So it went, and obviously they go into an engineer hearing, blah, 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 we want your password, blah, blah, blah. And the first case said, no, you can't have the password. It's, it's a product of his mind. Uh, it's, it's his thought product. You can't take it. The Fifth Amendment rights apply. But what the, the new case says is, no, it was a foregone conclusion. Um, and the way that works, it's not an exception we talk about because it's the Fifth Amendment. But the foregone conclusion is, is the reason your Fifth Amendment rights protect you, obviously, is you have a right to um, self-incrimination. You don't have to speak, you know, right to remain silent, you know, self-incrimination. But there's what's known as immunity. Um, they can grant you immunity. And what they're using and what you're getting immunity on is, is you don't have a right to your evidence. And who brought up the, uh, the breathalyzers? I think it was 
Yeah, right there. Now, breathalyzers aren't protected by the Fifth Amendment. That is a physical evidence. It's like fingerprints, it's breathalyzers, or blood tests. These are not protected. It's not self-incriminating. That is a physical product, okay? That is your blood. That is evidence. And it's, it's, it's difficult to explain, and I had a hard time explaining it at ShmooCon because it gets really technical, but if they grant you immunity, so they, the government has the duty to authenticate evidence. If they bring it in, they have to be able to say, okay, you've done this. It's, it's their responsibility, obviously, right? Uh, innocent until proven guilty. Anybody like it? Good stuff there. But they have to prove that this piece of evidence is yours. It has to be authenticated. You can't just take it into the, what? It's, it's here. No, no, it's, it still applies. There's, there's evidentiary fights constantly over this if you have a good defense attorney. But they have to prove that it's, it's, it's a real piece of evidence to get it in. That's the first hump. And then once it ends, the jury can decide how good it is. But so if, they, if, if you said, if, for this case, if he unlocks the pat laptop, okay, if it's locked and he hadn't shown it to the government already, if he unlocks it, the government could have said, hey, he had the password. It was obviously his laptop. That's authenticated. Do you know what I mean? It, it's, it's a real piece of evidence. It's his. Now it's in. So what they do is they grant immunity. They say, we won't admit in court, or we can't admit in court, that you typed in the password and opened it, but we can use the files from the hard drive. Now, they have to authenticate it outside of that. They have to get someone to come in and say, I saw this guy using the laptop, or I did this. And that's, that's where these cases turn, because in the second one, when he overruled it, he said it was a foregone conclusion that the laptop was his, because he had handed it over to the government agent. It was already open. He admitted it was his laptop. Scott? OK, so now he doesn't give him the password, and it's in, he's in contempt of court. He's in contempt. What would the charge be versus his speedy form one, which is going to be seven years for every count? There's, there's actually a lot of talks on this, and it's funny. Um, some people suggest that it would be better for him to be held in contempt, but criminal contempt has no limits on what it can be done. Okay. Um, if it's criminal contempt, they can just hold him indefinitely. So it's like, you know, life like at that point. But there's, the what's actually <laughs> funny is, is uh, one of the uh, professors who writes about this, I think it was uh, Oren Kerr, but he talks about, um, what happens if he just forgot the password? So, uh, well, and I should mention the case. They said he has to provide an unencrypted copy of the contents of the hard drive. He does not have to provide the key. The key is a product of the mind. It's still his password. He does not have to provide the password, but he has to provide an unencrypted copy of the hard drive. Now, how are you going to pair up that that's the actual contents of the hard drive? It gets interesting, because they have to authenticate that. They have to say, yes, this was the hard drive we looked at. Otherwise, it's not admissible. Right. Now, how do they prove they're that? Not and they, and they can't say that he unencrypted this and gave it to us. And they're not going to let him do it on the original initially. He's no, it's, it's going to be a copy of the drive. Okay. Yeah, he's not going to get the evidence of that. But he would have that D drive not mounted. He could have just said, no, take my laptop. I'm going to go through. Yeah, right. and this, he wouldn't have, they they wouldn't have been able to tell him. No, not at all. Yeah. Tell him to give up the password for that drive either. No, they can take your laptop, though. You have a question? Um, they do because they don't know better. Yeah, yeah, they, they just turn it off. I mean, it, it, they didn't do it on purpose. It wasn't like, oh, this is encrypted, let's turn it off. They just turned it off and was like, oh, crap, it was encrypted. They didn't realize PGP was on there. Um, if he argued that it was a 22-year-old midget that wanted to remain nameless, could they compel this person to come forward? Well, if he knew the midget's identity, I mean, they could say, well, he said that it was a 22-year-old midget, but he won't give us the name. You know. Well, See, that becomes a question of fact. The jury gets to describe that. Remember, we, we have trial by jury here. I mean, it's optional. You can do a judge. But it comes down to, like, I can say anything I want. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm on trial. I can get up and be like, yeah, that's not my laptop. Random bits assembled. I swear it happened. But who's going to believe that? Well, no, and that's not a laptop, but it's private information. That, that guy's just a pervert because he thought it was his. Well, what's well, funny, uh, actually, uh, kiddie porn laws have actually been defined now as it's a depiction of a child. Is that correct, Scott? It, it, it switches for it. It can't be a cartoon. It can't be. Yeah. It, it, it's I mean, it, it has to be 50% of the picture, usually generally contact or something that actually shows that the general. You know, some state defined it as, uh, I, I was reading something on a depiction of, so it doesn't even have to be an actual child. It just has to be a depiction. I'm sure those are all going to uh, go up on appeal. It's been beat every time. Yeah, well, it's been flipped over every time. Yeah, it's been the, thrown back several they to, times. They even have to prove in most cases it was actually it was a real child. Yeah, it was a minor. Or go to Nick Nick and find out from national. That's. Yeah, but uh, 
I mean, you can argue anything you want, but it's going to go to a jury, and these cases are obviously tough. Um, but what's really interesting is the vault code versus key to a lock debate. Um, we won't cover it, but it, it, it does get interesting. Um, Yeah, I mean, they can take your laptop. If you're coming across the border and you've got an encrypted hard drive and they're like, we want to search your you know, laptop, they'll take it. And they'll, they'll take it sometimes for two weeks and give it back to you. Yeah. They'll, they'll encase the drive and they'll send it back to you. And they can sit there and try to decrypt it all they want at the, you know, on their own time because it's a border crossing. They, they have that right. No, they cannot tell you, give me the key, um, currently. You never know in the future. But um, yeah, they can detain you for, you know, obviously they can always hold you for 48 hours just for the fun of it. Uh, I actually wanted to take a laptop and go across the border and then come back and see if they detain me, but just encrypt the entire thing with TrueCrypt and see what happens. Thought it'd be fun, but I'm kind of sick, so. Obstructing, obstructing justice. Yeah. Um, well, there's, see, because, because you have Fifth Amendment rights, my guess, I don't think, it, most of this hasn't been tested yet, but if you're coming across the border and they say we want your password and you say no, you could probably evoke your Fifth Amendment rights. Um, now, obstructing justice would be interesting. You could say I forgot it. Uh, but I do believe that most border crossings now, it, it's, and I, I'm not sure I need to check the wording on it, but I think it's uh, a crime to lie to a border agent. I think it comes close to a, a perjury standard. So if you're like, I don't know, but they can prove you did know, uh, you might get in some trouble. Like I said, not legal advice. Don't rely on this right now because um, I don't have all the facts up to date right now. But um, we got a little more to go, a little more. We got some good stuff. Hold on. If it was encrypted and they were using steganography to put it inside another country, at that point, since it was encrypted, they couldn't pull a visible image out. Mm -hmm. Well, that's. You'd be beyond their skill set, from what I can tell you. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. That, as, every device in this house has a blink. The 12. But no, the, uh, we actually talked about ShmooCon that uh, police can't use Linux. But um, <laughs> Scott brought that up as Shmoo. But no, um, remember, it's, it's always the government's job of production. They have to authenticate and they have to produce. If they can say that we know that there was a, this file on your hard drive, they can force you to produce that because it's already a foregone conclusion. If they can't prove there was an image and they're just phishing, then you get Fifth Amendment. You, you do not have to incriminate yourself. But what's interesting about this case is they knew there were certain files on the hard drive. They didn't know there were all these files on it. The, they went through a few of them. So that's where the first case penned it, it, or hinged on. They said, no, they can't make and give up the password because who knows how much information is on there. And a lot of cases have been fighting about a hard drive can be terabytes and terabytes of information. So if they saw one file, are they now entitled to you know, tr you know, trillions of bytes of information? And this case basically says, yeah, they are. They, they saw one file, now they can open the whole hard drive. But if they say that they suspect it was technology, and they create their own key through their process, they can just as easily create a key that would make that thing disappear whether it was there or not. Well, sure, of course. But um, you know, that's, that's, a, that's an evidentiary fate. Uh, that, that's a fact-based thing. If you go in and are like, well, yeah, but that's not the image I was looking at. Now you got to produce the image you were. Um, and if they just come up with a random image, the, the statistically that's so improbable that to get up there and be like, no, that's not the right key. It just happens to look like kitty porn when you type in Bob. Uh, I don't believe any jury is going to buy that. That's, that's all fact-based. I mean, you can go through and in two minutes' time create a key to make that picture look like it was the one, but it would be a key for someone to type in there to do it. Well, yeah, but I, I mean, statistically that's so improbable. But that, that would be a question for fact. I mean, it would get up and you'd argue it both ways. Um, so Skydog's been drinking. He's got red eyes, blah, blah, blah. What's going to happen to him? Supposed to have these hoods. Yeah, exactly. They're going to do a bodily intrusion at this point. 
You know, a, there, it's, it's, a search, it's a strip search at this point. So it's non-routine, requires something more. Odd red eyes, he's shaking, which usually indicates what at a border? Drugs. Drugs. These are the most common cases at the border for strip searches, drugs. Um, it's, it's usually not, uh, most strip searches though are usually not actually Fourth Amendment. It's usually someone's been arrested and they're taking them to jail or something along those lines. You can strip search them going in, it's administrative. It's an inventory search. You can't go in and say, I stuffed the Mona Lisa up my ass. Um, I want it back now, they took it from me. So they, 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 they do these inventory searches going in. And this is the same with like if they confiscate your car, they usually will go through your car. And they don't need a warrant because they don't want you to say, you know, the Mona Lisa was in the back, obviously someone took it. So they go through and search your car, and that's, that's one of the nice little loopholes, I should say. Um, but it, it does have a valid reason. You don't want people coming back and saying, yeah, I lost some stuff at, at jail. So they do this before going in. Obviously contraband, you don't want somebody bringing in knives. Hold on, decode. I'm really running into Skydog's time. So questions we'll do outside. Um, recent cases, uh, these are uh, usually state level cases. These aren't even federal. But a 13 year old was strip searched. They were looking for uh, ibuprofen 800 milligrams. It was unreasonable. Uh, they dragged her in, and somebody had just said they found a girl with ibuprofen on her. And they're like, where'd you get it? And she was like, oh, Susie gave it to me. So they grabbed Susie, drag her in the office. The vice principal's like, strip search her. And they, they, the nurse, they take the nurse, and the nurse is like, I don't want to do this. But they take the nurse, and she goes through. And they said it wasn't, a, they tried to argue that it wasn't a strip search because they didn't make her take off her undergarments. They just made her pull them out. Uh, didn't fly. Basically, this case is funny. These are both civil. Um, they were suing for violation of their rights, which is fine, torts act, no problem. But um, they, uh, they said that the vice principal could be sued for violation of her rights, but the nurse couldn't. She got the Nuremberg defense. He made me do it. So it's kind of interesting. But um, this one is funny. Uh, well, not funny, I should say, but uh, interesting. A female motorist was strip searched after possession of misdemeanor marijuana. So they pull her over. They find a, I think it was a roach was in the ashtray, something along those lines. They pull her over. What? Yeah, it was still, you know, it was still there. But uh, they pull her over. They drag her in, no problem. So they, they drag her and find valid arrest, but they strip search her. But was, the reason they let her, uh, a violation of her rights was one, there was no rules that uh, males would be searched this way, only females. And there was closed circuit television, which the male officers could watch. Uh, it was someone, it was like uh, one of those states. I don't remember which state it was. Maybe it was Texas. Yeah, it sounds like Texas. Yeah, I think it was, it was, it was one of them. But it was interesting. Hold on, decode. You gotta wait till after. Sure. Just with the discussion we had, uh, I had a bunch of people at uh, DC 404 this past few weeks. How long is a reasonable amount of time for a police officer to hold you or to stop you? Detention. Um, there's, there's been cases actually that say they can hold you for a pretty decent amount of time uh, to bring like a drug dog in to search the car. In but the some people say it's like five to 15 minutes. In the state of Georgia, is it maximum 20 minutes? Is it 20? Yeah. I, I've seen cases that are five to 20. Some people have been held for you know, 30 or more. It, it's, it's, it's a question of fact again. It's where it gets really tricky. The decode is not a licensed attorney. This is not legal advice. Uh, so during the strip search, the, uh, the examining officer notices a lump in Skydog's throat. Uh, obviously, that's the cell phone. So what do they do at this point? Well, yeah, they'll either x-ray or do a bodily intrusion. Um, so they go in pulling something out. Again, non-routine. A lot of crossover with other amendments. It uh, can re require a warrant depending on the level of urgency. So obviously, in this case, they're suspecting drugs. And cases say that if they suspect drugs, they can go do a bodily intrusion without a warrant because it's a dangerous, it's an exigent circumstance. Basically, if a, if a balloon bursts in someone's colon with, filled with heroin, you're gonna die. So the government has a duty to go in there and remove it quickly because they don't want a dead corpse you know, sitting there that they've got to explain. That's a lot of paperwork that they don't want to do.